This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. Though they're not so well known now, Germany's revolutionary jet-powered Arado AR-234 Blitz bombers, or lightnings in English, claimed a few notable distinctions. They were the world's first operational jet bombers, the first jet aircraft to fly reconnaissance missions, and the last Nazi war machines to soar over Great Britain in April of 1945, just weeks before Germany's surrender. Fast, relatively small, and more advanced than anything that the Allies had. Ironically, AR-234s were rarely used as bombers, and most variants were ultimately relegated to the reconnaissance role because they could outrun even the fastest Allied fighters like Spitfires, Mustangs, and Thunderbolts. The AR-234 story began in late 1914, not long after the world was thrust into the Second Great War of the 20th century. The German Ministry of Aviation was interested in procuring a high-speed, jet-powered aircraft, primarily for reconnaissance use, though even in the early going, some considered them good bomber candidates as well. Of the aircraft manufacturers that received the Ministry's RFP, only Arado submitted a design. Dubbed the E-370, their plane featured a streamlined fuselage, high-mounted wings, and a pair of Jumo 004 turbojet engines housed in narrow nacelles under the wings. The Jumos were the first engines of their type to be used operationally, but in early versions, power was lacking, and later variants were equipped with four BMW 003 jets, which were slung from the wings in two distinct configurations. One in which each engine had its own nacelle, while in the second they were housed in larger double nacelles. During the war, thousands of Jumo engines were built, many of which powered Messerschmitt Me262s, the world's first operational jet fighter. Depending on the variant, the Jumos operated at between 6,600 and 10,000 RPM and produced anywhere from 1,650 to 2,600 pound-feet of thrust. By comparison, North American Sabres from the early 50s sported GE turbojets that produced nearly 6,000 pound-feet of thrust, and the Tabansky engines and the Russian MiG-21s manufactured two decades later managed 9,000. Arado engineers claimed that 234s would have top speeds of approximately 480 miles per hour, that's 780 kilometers an hour, service ceilings of 33,000 feet, and ranges slightly greater than 1,250 miles or about 2,000 kilometers. The ministry's original specs called for greater range, but the difference was only small, and since Arado was the only company that expressed interest, two prototypes were ordered. The airframes and associated systems were nearly finished by the end of 1941, but the Jumo engines were far from being ready thanks to technological difficulties and supply line disruptions caused by the constant Allied bombardment. In fact, the first engines weren't delivered until early 1943, and when they did finally arrive at Arado's factory, they were deemed too unreliable for flight and were relegated to ground testing only. Nonetheless, better engines were eventually delivered, and the first AR-234 made its debut flight on the 30th of July 1943 at Rhein Airfield in northwest Germany. Progress was slow, and the second prototype crashed the following October after experiencing a catastrophic string of mishaps, including a fire, inoperable instruments, and two engine failures. Not surprisingly, the plane lurched into an uncontrollable dive at 4,000 feet, 1,219 meters, and seconds later slammed into the ground and burst into flames, killing the pilot instantly. Though Arado 234s would eventually weigh more, designers originally intended to keep their weight under 16,000 pounds, or about 7,300 kilograms. To this end, early prototypes incorporated an unconventional landing gear. Depending on size and application, landing gears on many aircraft can account for between 10 and 20% of the total weight. By eliminating wheels, struts, and hydraulic system, 234s would be lighter, faster, and able to carry heavier payloads further. In short, it was the Luftwaffe's dream scenario. But with these vital components missing, landing and taking off was going to be a little bit tricky to say the least. Arado's solution was a detachable tricycle landing gear that made it through preliminary testing, but for a host of reasons, it was scrapped on production models. On the ground, the apparatus worked like a conventional landing gear, but once the aircraft was aloft, the dollies were jettisoned instead of retracting into the fuselage. Of course, these jets were never meant to land on finished airstrips, but instead were restricted to touching down on grassy fields where the relatively soft earth would 
absorb much of the impact. Each 234 would have one reinforced skid plate protruding from the bottom center of the fuselage and another one near the end of each wing. The former would bear the brunt of the landing, while the latter prevented the aircraft from rolling over onto its side. For many test pilots, landing in the rain was a particularly hair-raising experience because the water on the ground acted as lubricants, which prevented the aircraft from slowing down quickly, and since there were no brakes, 234s only stopped when they ran out of momentum. Though technically feasible, this setup was hard on airframes, and at least some of the weight savings gained from ditching the landing gear were negated by the addition of more rigid structural components. AR-234s were also among the first aircraft to incorporate high-visibility bubble canopies in the front of their fuselages as opposed to protruding from the top of them. This made them more aerodynamic than conventional designs, but unlike other bombers, they were crewed solely by a pilot whose jobs included flying the aircraft, navigating, aiming and dropping the bombs, and remotely operating the defensive cannon in the tail busy guy. A 41.5 feet long, that's 12.6 meters, just over 47 feet from wingtip to wingtip and tipping the scales at 21,600 pounds or 9,800 kilos, 234s weren't big by bomber standards. The Junkers Jumo Axial Flow Turbo Jets in the early versions produced nearly 4,000 pound-feet of thrust in tandem were enough to propel a moderately loaded aircraft past 460 miles per hour in level flight. Cruise speed was about 400 miles per hour, 643 kilometers an hour, and if pilots discovered an enemy fighter approaching, they could generally accelerate out of harm's way if the adversary was detected early enough. T-34s had climb rates of about 2,600 feet per minute, but by comparison, P-51 Mustangs were capable of climbing at nearly 3,500 feet per minute. Hence, Allied pilots often attacked T-34s during takeoff and landing, and they were slow and vulnerable. Though visibility on the front and sides was exceptional, 234 pilots had no means of viewing what was behind them except through a periscope. These periscopes were also used for directing fire from the aforementioned cannons that were facing rearward. Though all 234s had periscopes, the cannons were omitted on some variants because it was assumed that the aircraft's speed alone offered adequate protection from enemy fighters. Fully loaded, blitzes could carry about 3,300 pounds, that's 1,500 kilos of bombs, which, relative to their weight, was about what piston engine bombers could carry. But though not necessarily any more efficient on a pound for pound basis than aircrafts like the B 17s and Lancasters, 234s were nearly twice as fast. That said, whereas most bombers stowed their ordnance in internal bays, the Arados carried their bombs on external hardpoints. Though this arrangement increased drag and fuel consumption while reducing speed and range, it was necessary because the inside of the plane's narrow fuselages were reserved almost exclusively for fuel. In fact, later four-engine versions had three internal tanks, the forward most of which held 378 US gallons, the middle one held 219 gallons, the one nearest the tail having another 407. Poor takeoff performance was a constant issue, and the Arado's engines sucked down fuel at an alarming rate at full throttle, so that by the time they were airborne, they'd often already consumed a significant portion of their overall load. To increase performance and minimize consumption during takeoff, some Arados were fitted with two Walter liquid fueled rockets attached to the wings next to the engines. Each provided about an additional 1,100 pound feet of thrust, and more importantly, they carried their own fuel. These rockets burned for a short time, after which they were jettisoned. Now, we'll get back to today's video in just a moment, but first, here's a message from today's sponsor, Squarespace. This is the age of creation. Think about it. Everybody is out there making something. They're writing a blog, they're making a store, they're doing a podcast. What about a YouTube channel? If you want a website to complement it, you do it with Squarespace. Whatever you're thinking about doing, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace, the perfect web tool to help you turn the internet into whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're the kind of hands-on person with lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly a site should look like. If so, very cool. Squarespace gives you all the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to worry about. Maybe you just need something functional, something that works with minimal thought so you can stay focused on your website's content. Then just use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's both fresh and simple. And once you're done setting up your website, locking in the name, maybe playing with some of the colors, there's tons of extra features that Squarespace provide so your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. Everything you need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on our next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash side projects to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. 
And now back to today's video. Eventually, the Ministry of Aviation asked Arado to produce two new prototypes for even more capable 234s, designated the B and C variants. But whereas earlier versions had no internal bomb bays, these new models remedied this persistent Achilles heel. Now, the new jet bombers had fully retractable tricycle landing gears and internal bomb bays, and the first prototype leapt skyward in mid-March of 1944. Though similar to their predecessors, these new models were recognizable by the moderate humps in the mid-portions of their fuselages in which the bulky landing gears were stowed. To make the necessary room, the central fuel tank was removed, and the fore and aft ones were enlarged to make up for the difference. But not surprisingly, flight testing revealed that the added weight made the planes nearly 50 miles per hour, 80 kilometers an hour slower, which pegged their top speeds at less than that of late war Mustangs and Thunderbolts. By late 1944, a number of units had been delivered to operational units, but production was severely disrupted thanks to the aforementioned Allied bombing raids, material shortages, and other logistical issues. Plans called for Arado to produce as many as 500 234s per month, so all told, less than half of that were built during the entire war. Pilots were generally impressed with their performance, but 234s were taxing to fly, and the Jumo engines were prone to flaming out. And generally had to be rebuilt or replaced after just 10 or 12 flight hours. Of the B variants, some were modified for reconnaissance use, while others served as dedicated night fighters. For the latter role, they were equipped with two forward-firing 20mm cannons and VHF radar units that could track enemy aircraft well past visual range in the dark, at least theoretically. To help manage these roles, a second crew member was added in a cramped compartment behind the pilot. But despite time-consuming and expensive modifications, the aircraft just weren't capable of tracking Allied planes at night, let alone shooting them down. No night kills were ever recorded, and by early 1945, production had shifted to newer variants, most of which featured four BMWs instead of two Juno engines. At just less than 1,400 pounds, 625 kilos apiece, the BMW turbo jets were housed together in wide, wing-mounted nacelles. Increasing thrust to nearly 7,000 pound-feet with minimal weight gain, the new and improved 234s were even faster. In addition to the performance gain, this engine change was largely made to free up Jumo engines for use on ME262s, which were an even bigger priority. An improved cockpit was also added, including a more flush-mounted rear-viewing periscope and fewer individual widescreen pieces, which improved aerodynamics and airframe strength and spread up production. Additional, but ultimately unincorporated upgrades included high-thrust Heinkel jet engines and swept crescent wings, which would have improved low-speed handling and top-speed performance. Although an operational test squadron was ready and waiting for their new birds, a dozen were finished by war's end, only half of which had engines. The day before Christmas in 1944, German divisions launched a number of offensives in and around the Ardennes and the Belgian city of Liège. Coinciding with one of the severest winters in European history, the windy, cloudy, and snowy conditions negated Allied air superiority, and many fighters and interceptors were grounded altogether. Cold, hungry, outnumbered, and isolated. American soldiers had been tasked with halting the Wehrmacht's push towards Antwerp in the epping engagement that would come to be known as the Battle of the Bulge. Amidst advancing enemy infantry and artillery bursts, GIs reported hearing aircraft approaching, but instead of the telltale rumble and drone of piston engines, they emitted eerie hisses, unlike anything they'd ever heard. Moments later, a flight of 234s screamed overhead, each aircraft carrying 1,100-pound bombs en route to an Allied supply facility near Liege. The planes flashed past, dropped their bombs, and then lighter and faster they sped towards home. But though Allied fighters attempted to intercept them, they got little more than a passing glance at the 234's tails before the revolutionary bombers left them in the proverbial dust. AR-234s also played a pivotal, if ultimately unsuccessful, role in taking out the Ludendorff Bridge at Ramagen, which was captured intact by the US 9th Armored Division on March 7, 1945. During the Allied onslaught, German demolition teams failed to blow the bridge, after which they threw everything but the kitchen sink, including infantry, tanks, floating mines, and huge mortars, as well as railway guns. All told, dozens of multi-aircraft sorties were flown by 234s against the bridge as well, but they were never able to put their bombs on target. 
target. The first official record of a blitz being shot down came a few days later when a US Air Force captain, Don Bryan, made a confirmed kill in his P-51. The German bomber was slightly faster, but on that day, Bryan and his speedy Mustang managed to get the upper hand. Spotting a 234 making a bombing run on the bridge, Bryan hammered his throttle, dove, and intercepted the bomber as it made its ascent away from the target. Then, blasting away with his 50 caliber machine guns, he knocked out one of the Arado's engines before slipping behind the stricken machine and finishing the job. Throughout the war, the Allies were keen on capturing Nazi jets, but 234s only fell into their hands just before and immediately after Germany's surrender. After the war, hundreds of German aircraft were snatched up by the Brits, Russians, and Americans and whisked back to their respective countries for testing and analysis. Of these, jets like the Arado 234 were the most coveted because their engines and designs were far more advanced than anything the Allies had at the time. However, many of the 234s that were recovered were severely damaged or without engines, though those that were airworthy underwent extensive testing until the late 1940s. They might have had more impact if development had continued and more had been produced, but in the end, 234s were revolutionary duds that just came too late. Though many of their design elements and much of their engine technology found its way into post-war Allied aircraft like MiG-15s and F-86 Sabres. Now, only one 234 is known to exist, an aircraft that was surrendered to the British at the Wehrmacht Air Base near Stavanger, Norway. After a five-year renovation project that began in the mid-1980s, it's now fully restored and on permanent display at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.